Right, ma bi to get. I guess to akish nerishi rice ke young wolf. On my matrilineal side, I'm Sosri Bia, an Eastern Shoshone woman with ancestral connections to my Namana, Benedeka, Comanche, Honey Eaters band relatives. <clears throat> On my paternal side, I'm Haradza Hinuetha Mia, a Haradza Mandan woman with ancestral connections to my Uppsala Gay Crow relatives. I'm a member of the Wide Ridge clan and a child of the Low Cap clan. I'm here at Yale. Um, completing a fellowship, the Andrew w. Mel w. Mellon Postdoctoral Associate in Native American Art and Curation and the Yale University Presidential Visiting Fellow. At the Yale University Art Gallery, they've put together a land acknowledgement and I'll add to that my welcoming statement. The Yale University acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scattercook, Golden Hill, Pagatsit, Niantic, and the Quinupiac and other Algonquin speaking peoples have stewarded through generations of the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations in this land. I'd like to welcome you both for joining us today or welcome you all for joining us today um, as part of this semester is evoking ancestral memory guest speakers who are Native American and Indigenous artists. Today, our last presentation is with Lakosh Joshua D. Henson. Um, joining me today is uh, Assistant Morgan Freeman. We are at the Wordle Study Center at the Yale West Campus. Um, graciously given space here to present in the Alan Chasanoff classroom by Judy Dittner and staff. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to learn a little bit about the artwork that Lakosh has been creating through these challenging times of COVID, as well as how he integrates his knowledge of the Chickasaw language, um, cultural um, significance, symbolism, all of that within his works. Lakosh Joshua D. Hinson is of Chickasaw, Choctaw, Muskogee, Creek, Cherokee, and Euro-American ancestry and is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. Hinson, whose Chickasaw name Lakosh translates as Gord, is of the Imatapo, their Lean Two People House Group, and Kowishto Panther clan. Lakosh will lead a lecture on the complexities of his recent cultural and language-inspired multimedia artwork, which negotiates impacts of COVID-19 on his positionality and creative perspective as a Nanak B. Nanak B. Nanak B. Uh -huh. Maker. A fluent speaker of the Ch Chickasaw language and an award-winning artist, he holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in painting from the Abilene Christian University, a master's degree in Native American history from the University of New Mexico, and a PhD in Native language revitalization from the University of Oklahoma. He makes art on the Chickasaw Nation Reservation in Ada, Oklahoma. This program is generously sponsored by the Yale Department of the History of Art, the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History, the Yale Group for the Study of Native America, and the Yale Native American Cultural Center, and the Yale University Art Gallery's Martin A. Ryerson Lectureship Fund. Um, again, I extend uh, my warm welcome. I apologize for any mispronunciations as I work to learn my own languages and the languages of others in the area. Um, I acknowledge the ancestors that were here, the, those of us who are still here and those of us who are still to come. Um, I hope that you open your hearts and your minds to our conversation and um, what we choose to share with you today. And any questions that you have, please provide those in the question and answer section. Also, as we move to Lakosha's presentation, we will still broadcast the video, but you can choose to pin our video um, instead of seeing um, a separate screen, but you will be able to see his presentation slides and you can adjust on your own laptops or screens how big you want those to be beside each other. Um, with that, thank you. 
Lakash for joining us for coming all the way out from Oklahoma. Um, I hope that we are able to host you in a good way and you learn a lot. Um, thank you so much for being open to sharing your knowledge with us. While Lakosha is here, we're going around and we're visiting many of the collections on campus, the Yale Peabody collections, the Yale University Art Gallery collections. We're also going to make it over to the Beinecke um, collections and look at some rare, rare books and archives. Um, this morning, we were at the Ornithology Lab hosted by Christophe, which was pretty fantastic. Mm -hmm. We got to see some wonderful birds over there, um, our relatives. and. Later on during his visit here, we'll be viewing some more um, collections with the Peabody and in the hopes that we will build a strong relationship of collaboration to help with reinterpretations, to help with um, symbolic meanings and significance of the materials that are here. Um, and so because of the space that we're in, you know, I want to acknowledge our ancestors and what we do, we're using our hearts and the teachings that we have. And I apologize for any missteps with that. So Mazagrat, I'll hand it over to Lakosh. And after his presentation about 1.30, we're gonna open it up to conversation questions between us. And then we'll open it up to all of you who are joining us today. Um, please put your questions in the question and answer option, but the chat is open to everyone. Mazagrat. Um, special thanks to Dr. Young Wolf and Yale um, University in particular. I'm so pleased to be able to. Um, be here today and have this conversation with friends um, old and, and new um, about my recent work that uh, I've been doing since we entered this uh, pandemic in uh, roughly March of 2020. Um, so the title of my presentation um, is Ishkobofoni Chunkash Michabiko Polo, which is Skulls, Hearts, and Disease Chukasha Art in the Time of COVID. So I'm going to share the screen now. There we go. Okay, all right, let's go to the next one. So in the traditional way, I would say, um, Joshua D. Henson, So uh, as Dr. Youngwolf said, I am uh, lean to house people I'm a member of the uh, Panther clan and um, I descend from those, I descend from those people and I'm a Chickasaw person. So you can see here on, um, on the screen, this, this is a work that represents um, my female ancestors, Chikasha Poya means we are Chickasaw. It's pen and ink on paper from 2018. Um, you'll see me in the lower right. And I descend from nine generations of Chikasha women, documented nine generations, beginning with the earliest, my grandmother, who was called Minta Hoya, who was born near modern day, uh, what's called today Tupelo, Mississippi, in roughly the mid 1600s. And then ending with my own mother, who's to the left of me, um, Charla Henson, who was born in Gainesville, Texas, um, in the late 40s. Um, so as, um, as Dr. Young will mention, I am a citizen of Chickasaw Nation. Um, we're a large nation of 70,000 people. Our reservation is located in South Central Oklahoma, um, bordered by the Canadian River to the north and the Red River to the south. Um, I've been learning my language since about 2000 um, and have spent you know, these last 20 years um, spending time with my elders and, and becoming a, a fluent speaker, not a native speaker. This is something important, a distinction to be made. Mm -hmm. And I know Royce understands like native capital N speakers were born for it. It was the first language they heard when they entered the world. 
but that's not me. Um, I'm a fluent speaker. I can hang with the old folks, <laughs> but I'll never be a native speaker, and, and that's okay. In our language, we call ourselves Anompa Shali. It means the one that carries the language. Um, we carry it forward like an emissary, um, a messenger for our people, even though uh, we were not necessarily born to it, but we were born for it. Um, in addition to my professional life, which is dedicated to the revitalization of our language, Kashanumpa, my avocation is, is um, equally significant in many ways as a nunik B or, or a maker or an artist or however somebody would care to describe me. Um, but I care passionately about our people, our ancestors, the land that we come from, the land that we're on now. And uh, I hope that you'll see through this presentation that this uh, the language encompasses everything. It's not a discrete thing. It's a, it's a whole living organism that encompasses who we are as people. And we're a part of that. So this uh, next slide. There we go. Thank you. Um, Abiko polo is an old word and it means a terrible disease. And so this this term would have been used for any number of epidemics and pandemics that our people have been through um, time immemorial. So in this particular case, we're talking about COVID-19. Um, but when I think about this experience that I have had individually and then um, with my coworkers, uh, my co-language learners and so forth, I, I always think about uh, February of 2020, right before we shut down. There was a wild onion dinner. Um, Royce knows, you know, spent so much time in Oklahoma. It's good eats. Yeah, wild, yeah. <laughs> wild onions, this wild food that, that we collect and we have um, wild onion dinners all across the Eastern part of the state. And in this one in particular was at Asbury Methodist Church there in Ada, Oklahoma, which is where the headquarters of our nation is located. And uh, it was a fundraiser for a, a youth uh, traveling basketball team that was gonna go play a tournament on Navajo uh, Res. <laughs> Um, they ultimately didn't get to go, but we, we were there, um, you know, having our wild onion dinner and we had heard rumblings like something was coming, you know, it's a disease that was spreading. It was going to be in the United States before you know it. Um, it was a great dinner. The food was really good. I got to see one of my main teachers, Sam, um, Stan Smith, rather Stan Smith. Um, that was the last time I saw him before he passed away. And he was the first speaker that we lost during COVID, not because of COVID, but during COVID. So I always think of that wild onion dinner and it, almost immediately following that, uh, we began COVID protocols on our reservation. Um, everything shut down, employees were sent home, we closed our gaming facilities, remote work, we canceled all in-person events. Um, and in particular, the, the main concern for me, not, I mean, beyond the health of my immediate family was really more about the health, concern for the health of our elders. Um, they're incredibly active. They don't like to stay at home. We're just pleading and pleading, please guys stay home and stay safe until we could get this vaccine, which would come much later. So in this sort of environment of cloistering away and, and trying to hide away and be careful. I mean, we're doing crazy things like washing our groceries and yeah, you yeah. Know, always wash your hands and this sort of thing. Um, this work, this COVID work, sort of emerged at a time when we were slowly settling into this new normal. And then partially, I think, because, um, you know, our, the, the life work, the language work was paused, mm -hmm. I had some time to do and energy to create this sort of work. So this was this work that you'll see, this body of work was really a way for me to work through um, in a creative visual sort of way. Mm -hmm. uh, things that we were experiencing at home. Excellent. Yeah. So this is the first work that I made um, as a part of this COVID-19 um, series. This is uh, a Chikasha pintail effigy. Mm -hmm. This is a Drake pintail. Um, they're common all across the United States and into Canada and even down into Mexico, Central America, and in the Caribbean. Um, so this is polychrome wood. Um, and we'll explore here in a moment uh, some of the, uh, the symbolism that connects to COVID and kind of reflects the times that this object was made. But the interesting thing was that I had been commissioned by a physician from Tennessee to create a, a pintail. And I had sent him a design and I, I liked this sort of head up, like when they take a drink and they you know, pull their head back. 
I said, oh, let me do something like this. And I said, I, I have this idea. I want to incorporate um, the time and the place and the circumstances of its creation with uh, symbols on the body. So I want to relate it to COVID. And, and he's also an artist. So he mm. was like, I'm down. Let's do this. So um, we ended up with this uh, Chikasha duck effigy in, in the time of COVID. And I'm really grateful to him for allowing me to do this. So we can go ahead and advance. Here's another <coughs> um, side. It's all, it's a really four parts. It's a two part body, it's hollow inside. And then the head is a single piece. And then the tail itself is oak. that's inlaid in the, in the back. Northern white cedar is the principal material. And then I just use artists oils um, yeah. to, to paint it. So we can go ahead to the head. And you'll notice this motif in the eye. So we move forward to the next slide. You'll see the inspiration. Um, this is a, a SARS CoV-2 um, virion. And uh, if you go back to the slide, you'll see this is my yeah. sort of graphic um, way of capturing that with the little sort of T's, the little arms um, sticking out. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, if we move forward, uh, one more, you'll see another inspiration for the motifs that are falling down the cheeks of the pintail. Mm -hmm. This is a Mississippian death's head, also sort of a falcon mask, Middle Tennessee from about 1200 years ago. Um, wow. And so I was thinking of this as sort of like in the context of such great disease and loss and illness. And I was thinking about how our ancestors also um, addressed these sort of concerns, not just disease, but the idea that we don't live <coughs> forever mm -hmm. visually. And that this is what happened in the work. Um, so if we move ahead to the, the next slide, you'll see in this speculum or this wing patch, you'll see a variety of motifs, uh, principally is this skull um, motif, this grinning skull that comes from Moundville, Alabama, which is an ancestral place for us. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's surrounded by the COVID virions again. And then finally in the background, both in the front and in the rear part of the design, you can see um, bone designs that were also derived from this next slide. Um, this was an object that was recovered um, oh. in an archaeological dig um, at Moundville. And you can see the graphic representation by an artist of the skulls and this hand and eye symbol. We'll explore this hand and eye symbol here more in a moment, but this is how the bowl looks as, you know, if you unroll it. It's clearly, you know, a funeral object. Um, it's talking about the transition of the soul from one place to another. Mm -hmm. um, but, but as I said, we'll, we'll speak more about that uh, hand here in a moment. So this next um, image, this is the first work on paper and again, uh, Everything that I do is titled in the language. So this is abika opolo. Again, it means the terrible disease, or you can, you can make it a compound, abika opolo, but it means the same thing. Mm -hmm. And here I was, again, riffing on these design elements that, that I had introduced into that um, pintail effigy. And in this case, I'm aligning them in a particular way to the four directions, four seasons of the year, um, the four arbors at a ceremonial ground, even the, the idea of a sacred fire that exists at the heart of every ceremonial ground. Only in this case, it's, it's a symbol of, of death and a, a you know, concern that I had at that time, what was going to happen. Um, yeah. And you can see again, the, the hands are represented here. Of course, we were doing everything we could um, on the reservation to take care of ourselves, including masking, um, washing hands, staying at home. And so some of that, uh, could, I couldn't help but, but um, deal with that in the work. So the title of this one is um, And that means being far from one another, um, they're still speaking or being far from one another, they're speaking. So you can see the six, the six foot distance in the footprints below. They're mm -hmm. clearly speaking to one another. They're wearing these surgical masks and then the the COVID virions are floating um, above their heads. This is another work on paper. I was exploring a lot of these um, images in preparation for a virt virtual Indian market, which happened in the fall of 20. Um, and so a, a lot of these, really this entire series now lives with, with other people, collectors and friends and so forth. So the, the next one um, is Ibichela Aslipia Fuka, which just means like they're wearing a mask. 
And it's the same variation on this theme with the grinning skull wearing a mask. We see the hands, the forearms, and then the COVID virions floating above it. The next one is again, another variation. You have a skull figure from Mountville who's masked. You see the virions surrounding the head and then the figure is washing its hands. Mm -hmm. This next one was something that was really quite challenging for us. You know, we have, we have a long tradition of ceremonial um, dancing and that continued from time immemorial until the late, maybe 1930s. And we brought back our stomp dances in the mid 90s. And we had danced every year, four times a year in the summer, as we're supposed to do from 94 until 2019. And because of the pandemic and our, um, our efforts to avoid the contagion and spreading, you know, we had to suspend our ceremonial dances for both 2020 and 2021. Um, when I return on Saturday, we'll have our first night dance since before the, the pandemic. So yeah. I'll, I'll make a mad rush it's from the airport <laughs> to the- It's a tough schedule. But it's, yeah, you know, we, we do things because yeah. we ought to, yeah. so. Um, in this case, um, this is Itin Ho Pocket Ho Hitha. Again, you can see this idea of space between them as the, the footprints are below. They're masked and they're singing. You see the men, men sing. Women generally uh, carry the turtles. You'll see this central figure. She's wearing box turtles. Um, on her legs that are uh, female box turtles that are ceremonially killed, dried, filled with river stones. And the women do that, the heavy labor of, um, of shaking shells. In Chickasaw, it's loksi shali, it means the ones that carry the turtles. And the dance items themselves are just called loksi, which is turtle. Mm -hmm. There's one dance where women sing the women's war dance, but we haven't performed that in some time. This one is hotosko, which means cough. He's coughing or she's coughing. We don't have grammatical gender, so you can translate it anyway. Um, and again, I'm just using this, the visual vocabulary of our ancestors from Moundville to explore what, in the, you know, trying to figure out what in the world was going on in the world at large. This is a piece that I created for an exhibit called Speak, Speak While You Can. Um, and it was all about uh, language endangerment, revitalization, the modern revitalization movements of our language in the Eastern part particular of Oklahoma, but really Indian territory as a whole. And I created this again in this context of, um, of COVID and I couldn't help but think about sort of um, all these deaths that we knew were happening what does this really mean? Is, a, is it a port, you know, portent of the end of the world or whatever the mm -hmm. case may be? And so in this case, there's a, a prophecy from um, the family of one of my language teachers who recently passed away a couple months ago. And this is Catherine Wilman, Pickens Wilman. And in the Pickens family had a prophecy. Uh, it says, Chikasha de Mano which means um, when the Chickasaws lose their language, the end of the world will be here. Mm. Um, and below, you won't be able to see this on the screen, but Lokosh is inscribed to the lower right, and then Tona was Mrs. Wilman's traditional name, and it's, that's inscribed to the left. Um, it's yeah. not that uh, I don't, I'm not particularly afraid of, of dying, but uh, I really enjoy living. We've got stuff to do, so I figure as long as we're doing this good work and creating new speakers, maybe we can push the end times away a little yeah. bit. So this is a uh, mixed media on canvas. Uh, it's my bride's favorite painting. It's a little macabre, but it's in our living room. She loves it. So what yeah. am I supposed to do, right? Give it to her. It's a lot of weight it's, on your shoulder, though, this prophecy, you know. It's pretty heavy. Our work with language yeah. and the times will be when we lose it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I really need to start eating better. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. Ditto. Hi. All right, so this next one, it's um, it means um, the doctor is battling the, the terrible disease. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we'll go ahead and advance to the next slide. It was based on this Shell Gorget, which is a Mississippian, mm -hmm. um, roughly 1250 to 1300 CE um, in Tennessee, which is our traditional, the Western part of Tennessee is traditional Chickasaw territory. So you can see if we go back, the image of the body um, our warriors wore what's called um, yatala, 
which mm -hmm. are feathered hair ornaments. So you can see the feathered hair ornament at the back, the mask, the face shield, you have the, the forked eye of a warrior. Mm -hmm. And this could, this could have easily been a male or a female figure. You know, um, our nursing staff and the doctors at Chickasaw Nation Medical Center, they were all, um, you know, in one accord fighting this terrible thing. And they, they really went through some stuff. I just felt like this was a way that I could honor that work. So you can see there's an intubation device in the figure's left hand. And then I have an iPhone where they're FaceTiming, mm -hmm. um, FaceTiming family members that were not able to be with their, with their folks um, yes. during this time. And that was probably, I mean, you know how relational we are. Like that was probably one of the worst things about COVID is, is not being able to attend funerals and do the rites, and sing the songs, all the things that we know mm -hmm. we're supposed to do. So every loss that we've had during this time was just, you know, markedly harder than it, than it would have been previously. Yes. From 2020 to now, we've lost um, 11 native speakers of Chickasaw. So we're roughly, we have roughly 30 uh, native speakers remaining. Wow, it's, you know, it's the same in a lot of the small communities yeah. that that same scenario yeah. is consistent yeah. across all of our communities. And some of us were still learning these long-term impacts mm -hmm. of going through these years and, and it's ongoing, right. it's still happening. Um, when it's not just the trauma in the moment, but it recalls past traumas. Yes. You know, 1918 was not that long <clears throat> ago. No, nope. 1728 was not that long ago. No, nope. um, and the consequences of all these things that we've been through as a people are still with us. So, um, I will say that it was a blessing in a certain way. Um, you know, our native speakers are a particular age, and they, you know, they're passing away because they've reached that time in their life. But we only lost one native speaker actually to COVID. We had uh, really incredible efforts um, on the part of the nation to. Um, to vaccinate uh, as soon as possible mm -hmm. native speakers um, and also those of us that are working with them in the program. Yeah, um, it so. was, that's what, you know, we had been talking about that, you yeah. know, those of us who were doing language and culture work directly with our elders mm -hmm. on within our tribal infrastructure, yeah. we actually were placed in that same level of an elder first to receive vaccines. Absolutely, yes. Because of yes. the type of work we yes. are doing. And that I don't think you we've seen that in other Western culture I would, that I, we were I treated no. with that type of care. Yeah, it was it was strange. It was also I mean it was gratifying, but also strange. Like you know we always think of ourselves as uh, helpers to the speakers, but in mm -hmm. this instance we were kind of brought up to the same level that they were because we are language carriers and we have you know I've got twenty something years of knowledge that they've imparted to me, and I don't know I'd like to think I'm helping other people mm -hmm. right access that knowledge too. So someone out there doesn't want me to die <laughs> just yet so well it's it's really wonderful you know and it'll be one of my questions mm -hmm. so you can think about it but you know these symbolic interpretations mm -hmm. of all of you know the motifs mm -hmm. everything that could be oh there's a line there's the shape these geometric each one of those though has such deeper meaning mm, yeah and then in some cases, far deeper than we can even know. Yes, you know, it's yes. A, our understanding is a spiritual one. And the importance um, of living living artists, that collaboration and working with each mm -hmm. other yeah. can't be, you know, we can't kind of just acquire pieces mm -hmm. without having these types of conversations. Right, because there's more. It's just not just the image. There's so much mm -hmm. behind it. Um, in this case, um, this was after Miller in 1942. I'm sure we're all familiar with mm -hmm. Rosie the Riveter. And in this case, the text is Iyamaka, which means a short way of saying we can do it. This is how my mm -hmm. teacher, Stan Smith, would have said it. And she's rolling up her arm. You can see her bicep. It says um, <laughs> Abika Apisachi, which means the one that looks after the ill. That's our word for doctor. Mm -hmm. And she has, um, you don't see her face, but I can guarantee she has traditional facial tattoos. And then on her hands and on her arms, um, she has uh, women's, traditional women's tattoo designs. Mm -hmm. um, some of this traditional tattooing is, is being um, brought back by Chickasaw women um, right now, which is really gratifying to yeah. see. So after Miller, 1942. The next one is after Munch, the Scream from 1893. Um, in this case, I just appropriated, you know, the, the structure of his image, the single figure, 
um, but you have those mournful symbols again mm -hmm. with this weeping death mask and the figure as he's moving towards us um, on the bridge is surrounded by these COVID virions again. And you can clearly see that in fact, this figure is either already infected or perhaps has, has passed. Maybe mm -hmm. it's just a spirit, but um, I mean, I have a, I have a broad education in, in art history, not just Native American, but in Western art history. And I just couldn't help but riff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, many of the pieces that continue to use the COVID virions, the skulls, the forearm bones, and so forth, they're really sort of memorial pieces. So in this case, it's Italy, um, 166,317. So that was the, the uh, case counts in terms of people who had actually passed away in the United States as of the date of this, which was um, August of 14, August 2020. Wow. The next one is, a, is another variation on a theme. And this is an early one where I actually incorporated the heart, um, which is not a, I mean, it's not a traditional uh, motif, at least for, for Chickasaw. The seat of the emotion is actually the throat, not the heart. Mm -hmm. Not that the heart's not important, but the throat is, is where you experience your emotions. So in this case, this is sort of a contemporary take. My contemporary take as a Chickasaw person using the visual vocabulary of our Moundville ancestors but trying to capture this idea of the memento mori. Um, in this case, it says chila chica uh, which means remember that you will die. Mm -hmm. And there's something, um, I mean, it's inevitable, but perhaps in some cases, we just don't like to think about it. But as I was thinking about death, there's something beautiful in a way, because like, you know, if we were to live forever, what's there to appreciate? I mean, there's something beautiful about, I have a particular chunk of time on this rock and I really want to do everything I can to squeeze life out of every moment. Yes. Um, so this is one thing that I was thinking about. Uh, my dissertation advisor um, owns this piece. It's in her living oh, room. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. Look how. You know it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go, to, yeah, let's go to the next one. There we go. This one also lives in Tennessee. It's um, Chikashi Ho in the time of COVID. Chikashi Ho is our word for a Chickasaw woman. And again, I just reimagined uh, reimagine Mona Lisa. Um, she's wearing traditional regalia or customary regalia, um, pre-contact regalia, including a bison robe. You know, people don't think of, of bison or buffalo as living, you know, east of the Mississippi River, but in fact they did mm -hmm. until the early 19th century. So she's wearing a bison robe. It's, it's a winter scene. She's wearing a deerskin dress, traditional shell jewelry, all of the um, tattoos are evident there on her forearms and she's resting her arm on a traditional um, Chickasaw pot mm. that has this sort of spiral. Some people say it's a water motif. Um, and then in the background, I mean, it does reflect the landscape behind, um, mm. behind Mona Lisa in the original, but I was thinking actually more of the riverbanks near uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Yes. Um, Sakti Sanfa Okina means the sloughing off riverbanks um, water road. So that was our, for that area around Memphis, that was our name for it. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, here's another one that the, the collector lives in Tennessee. This is um, Chickasha Gothic in the time of COVID. Of course, this is a yeah. riff on wood, 1930 American Gothic. I love this one. This, yeah. this was a fun one. I mean, you know, it can't be. Why, why, we're, why are we serious all the time? We got a joke, right? Yeah. So I've replaced the implements with implements that would have been, you know, commonly seen in the villages prior, in the old country prior to our removal. And he's wearing a military coat. He's holding a, a traditional Osage orange bow. You can see the yatala and the, the head, um, the design uh, of his hair. It's, it's uh, plucked and he's got jewelry and so forth. And then behind this, um, his, uh, his spouse, or in, perhaps his daughter, I'm not really sure. But having, and then behind them is the house, and you can see there was generally some um, figures, some car figures of birds or other animals on top of these houses. But if I could redo this again, I think I would actually change their positions because we all know that Chickasaw women are in charge. Uh, everything is theirs in the land itself, the household, everything is based on them, our clans in particular. So. 
this was fun, but if I ever make this a painting, I'm gonna swap their positions. Would there, um, would she be moved in front or still behind? And would she, you know, the perspective, is she standing directly beside him? I think that she, I think that she would uh, replace him in the foreground and mm -hmm. he would be standing behind her. Um, traditionally, Chickasaw women, when they took a spouse, you know, they were allowing this man to come and live with their people. Um, but obviously, they're different clans. Um, so the, the power, in essence, even though, you know, uh, all of our hereditary leadership were male, the only reason those men had access to power was because of their mothers mm -hmm. and the clans that they were born into and so forth. So, um, yeah, I wasn't thinking that deep. I just thought I'm a riff on wood. I mean, there's something really cool here. But like I said, I would I probably change this up if I ever redid it. Um, I have a madness for all things avian, so I couldn't help but do an Audubon. Um, in this case, you can see there's a a crow um, or a raven actually uh, wearing a a raven -y face mask, and that reminded me of the of the plague doctor mask. Yeah. that we'll see actually an image up here in a little bit. But um, I was riffing off of this, um, this image from uh, his huge collection of American birds that he did. Only in this case, you know, I, I closed the mouth and put a mask on it. And as, as we were um, at the ornithology lab today, mm -hmm. uh, Christoph was telling us the difference between the juvenile, the ivory-billed woodpecker, mm -hmm. yep. the the juvenile bills actually are shaped different mm -hmm. than the full grown ones because of use. Right, isn't that fascinating? Yeah, that was really interesting. Yeah. And those little details, it always makes me wonder if we go back then and really start looking at the collections mm -hmm. and materials that we have from our ancestors, yeah. how, how much did they know about which ones they were choosing? Mm -hmm. So if one has, is using the skin or a bird of a juvenile right. versus the adult, the older one. And right. We talk about that, you know, for my bachelor's degree, um, I requested through um, the, uh, the eagle, where we got to be on a wait, wait oh, list for the yeah, eagle. The eagle repository. Yes, yeah, the eagle repository. And the one that they sent me was they explained this is the first time I had actually had a really long conversation with me as they told me a bit more details about it is they said what we're sending you we don't often see mm. and they said because this is a mature golden eagle mm -hmm. a female mature golden eagle mm -hmm. but it is almost a dwarf oh wow it was actually quite small yeah, yeah. um compared to how large they get and they said we we see these when the eagle's very old. Hmm. And this one, um, I think it was, they had found it in a field. Wow. Um, but having that detail and then really thinking about mm -hmm. if we go back and we look at the materials that in collections here yeah. and kind of look at the, the differing versions or mm -hmm. differing types of feathers and all of those used, how much more can we tell from from those yeah. specific uses, because of course, we, with the hair, we wear right. specific feathers to signify different deeds, actions, mm -hmm. development, naming. Obviously, that's got to be in the collections as well. It's just a matter of thinking about yeah. it, having it in the forefront of your mind, and then re-examining these things that we we think we've known for years and years, right? Mm -hmm. So, no, and, that's excellent. Point. Yeah, and the representation in your work Kind of seeing those little details and i'm kind of excited to see in the future how are you going to incorporate kind of those what yeah. maybe we would say easter eggs all right yeah we had, a, we had a good easter eggs yeah but just those little things that yeah. you know if you know then you're able to pick it out yeah not not everything's for everybody no no sometimes it's just not. for the folks that know you yeah. know what i mean um in this case this uh this was inspired by a uh, a roman a mosaic that was uncovered in Turkey. The text itself is Chokchangmut Ishta Chiopen, which means if you're alive, you should be happy about it. Um, and of course, there's Mexican Coke, which is my favorite. He's holding Pishofa, which is a traditional, <laughs> yeah. a traditional corn and pork not dish. Pepsi. Not Pepsi, sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> and then an Indian taco down there mm -hmm. by his uh, left femur, <clears throat> or their left femur at any rate. So the next one is is the 
image that I was referencing. It's from the second to maybe the fourth century CE. And the mm -hmm. translation, of, an accurate translation is, you get the pleasure of the food you eat hastily with death, which is fascinating. Yeah. So there's, there's again, there's something about, you know, like a joie de vie, like let's grab a hold of this life and wring out of it what we can while we're still here. I don't know how to say joie de vie in Chickasaw. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. If you're alive, you're happy. That's about as close as I'm going to get. <laughs> anyway, here's the next that. one, right? Tattooed. Right. Tattooed. <laughs> um, this one is funny at Shuk Chang Mi Apa. I'm after Fritz Schulter. Uh, this just means that um, phony is eating ice cream. In this mm -hmm. case, it actually means frozen milk. Um, and this figure is wearing the traditional regalia of a male Chickasaw ball player including the collar, the yatala, and then this breech cloth. And it was inspired by Super Indian number no. two from 1971. Mm. Yeah. These are all small scale works on paper, smaller than eight by 10. Whereas in the case of Super Indian number no. two, it's, it's quite, quite large, like maybe three by five feet. Um, during this time, I was gifted this ledger. It came from Wichita Falls, Texas. And um, interestingly enough, I was, this gentleman who lived in Wichita Falls, um, we had some mutual acquaintances and he reached out to me and said, oh, do you, would you like this ledger I found? I know you're an artist. And uh, you know, while ledger work is really quite popular right now, it's not something that I had ever done. So I was like, well, I don't really do it, but send it to me and I'll divvy it up with mm -hmm. all my friends that do ledger work. Well, it was sort of, I don't know, however you wanna, however you wanna think about it. Um, it was interesting that he contacted me and sent it to me. When I cracked it open, it actually was from 1918, wow. 1918 to wow. 1919. So I thought, well, this is this is a this is a sign. I, I need to do something with this. So I did end up splitting it into two, and I gave half of it to a friend of mine who does lots of ledger work. And then I began to explore um, these COVID themes on the ledger paper itself, which again dates from 1918, 1919. This is again a riff on the four directions, this idea of the masked, um, rather in this case, the unmasked mm -hmm. um, skulls with that COVID symbol in the middle. And then as I moved along, they got um, quite a bit more complicated. So you can see these geometric figures, circles in this case, connected by lines. You have, you can see this anthropomorphic figure, um, center, sort of center bottom mm -hmm. with a horse and a man holding a bow walking along this path yeah. and then the, the skull with the COVID symbol sort of floating over it. Um, additionally, the entire background in red uh, represents COVID virions. And then throughout the image, we have significant dates where disease impacted our people, um, both in the old country prior to removal mm -hmm. and then even after we were removed. So 1736, yes. I think uh, 1857, <clears throat> Uh, 1789, 1918, and then finally 2020. Yeah, and it, it's, you know, if you make those interconnections, at least seeing the connecting lines between the different variants right. and the dates, is mm -hmm. you can go all along that trade route, all the way through the Mississippi, mm -hmm. all the way up the Missouri, yep. you know, back to my people, the Manda and Haradza, the right. Nuetta and Haradza, is 1736, vastly significant, mm -hmm. you know, huge population loss right and then again 1837 huge loss for smallpox 90 mm -hmm. percent of yep. our Nuetta families passed away mm -hmm. and we still have those stories yeah. and then experiencing again everything that our people did yeah. and how that's actually represented in our material culture mm -hmm. you know the shift of trade items mm -hmm. the loss the lack of trade items the fear of trade items yeah. um, and then how there is that continuous you know shared story of yeah. experience between multiple tribes mm -hmm. across the nation well and again as we were saying earlier 1837 was not long ago yeah the consequences of these things are still with us today but we don't consciously think about it yeah so in the case of these geometric forms the circles they they're derived from this map it's a 1723 mm -hmm. It was actually on deer hide. It was created by a Chickasaw person, and it covers um, from like New York State to Florida, all yeah. the way over to Texas, and then finally in the upper left, all the way up to uh, the Great Lakes, where many of our sort of traditional enemies were located. 
and you can see where the lines are cut short. These were, uh, these were like war roads. We were fighting with those people at that time, whereas we had positive relationships with the communities, these circle communities that are connected by lines. Um, the next slide is a recreation that I did on this really huge uh, deer hide that I got from a guy in Minnesota, and that's at our cultural center. Then the next one is uh, much, much earlier. This is from 2007, but I was riffing on this sort of idea, this uh, visual representation of a human. This is the only, you know, like early Chickasaw representation that we have of an anthropomorphic figure. So I represented in this style, a colonial trader bringing goods into the nation. Um, and uh, it's, it means the white, the white guys are coming, the white folks are coming, the language mm. there itself. And then the next slide, you can see uh, my brother, who's a, also obviously Chikusha and a musician, Micah P. Henson. He liked that image enough to have it tattooed on his neck. Wow, on his throat. Yeah, he was like, oh, I really love that. I want it on there. And I was like, well, it's kind of cool, but you and think it's really neck worthy. And he's like, <laughs> yeah. So. Well, we're emotions. Uh, yeah, right, it's right there. Right, your throat. right. So again, variations on this theme. In this case, I represented lungs. We, you know, we now know that it's not just a sort of a lung-based disease, but it's really systemic and um, has to do with um, blood in particular. So mm -hmm. um, there were other images where death as a figure represented by Phony um, reoccurs. Phony at spam at Intella I means uh, bone has some spam. And I was referencing, um, again, Fritz Shoulders, Indian with beer can from 1969, which is the next slide. There we go. We'll move through some of these more quickly. This was based on the lovers of Valdero, uh, mm -hmm. 6,000 year old skeletal remains discovered in Italy in 07. I just, it's so beautiful the way they're holding each other. So, mm -hmm. so we'll just move through these. There's the, um, that uh, plague mask that I was mentioning oh, earlier, yes. this sort of beak like, and it, it reoccurs as a motif um, later on. I also did really small works, um, like quarter sheets, again, with the COVID, um, the date, how many uh, people had passed away at that time. Um, as you see here, and then the next one. Sometimes I would vary them and do white uh, oil-based marker on top of India ink, um, rather than just the, the background of the paper. Mm -hmm. um, this next one is all red. Again, the four directions symbol. The next one is also kind of referencing, you know, you have these falling skull figures and then the four directions with the COVID motifs, as we see again here. Um, as we get later, you know, into this, this COVID experience, I started incorporating syringes as um, elements into the designs because we were getting we knew vaccines were coming mm -hmm. and this was this is exciting for us the idea that we actually had a tool to fight against this and protect our elders it's another memorial piece 317,000 dead another large syringe this is related in uh, because it's related to the the to death and the, the passage of the soul from this plane to another plane. Um, this hand symbol is actually a constellation. Uh, the, we call it the hand and eye symbol. Mm -hmm. You can see it here in the lower horizon. This is during the winter, yep. which is when it touches the earth. That's the easiest time for souls to transition. And I know your, your people yes, also the, recognize the this. Yes, Yep. Uh, recognize this constellation as the hand, including the, also the Lakota and the Crow. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is adjacent to the Milky Way, which in our language is Ofitobi Ihina, which means the white dog's road. And so traditional belief is that the soul um, goes through the eye in the hand, enters the Milky Way, follows the Milky Way um, to its ending point, And that's where the ancestors are waiting for people, uh, for their souls to come. And this is a this um, constellation is something that I've explored in other works, including this work on paper. Um, the next one is actually a, a bird effigy. In this case, it's a wood duck effigy, mm -hmm. in black and white. And you can see the hand constellation is on its back. Mm -hmm. uh, I created that work for Indian Market uh, 2021. 
And then the next one is actually a, a Chickasaw descendant um, who had the constellation um, tattooed on his forearm for his 40th birthday. Mm -hmm. This next image, you know, not everything I did, visually speaking, was directly related to COVID. It's mm. really quick before yep. we move forward to the other slide, just so yeah. that the audience knows. Um, you know, for for my people, Haraz, Amanda, and um, even some of my Uppsala gay relatives, mm -hmm. we only can tell these full stories at certain times of the year. Mm -hmm. They're yep. seasonal stories. Right. Um, and some families have a different timeline, but usually it's kind of that um, summer solstice mm -hmm. to winter solstice. Mm -hmm. Some it's winter solstice through the spring solstice. Yeah. Um, but with these, these type of stories, do you have that type of um, kind of protocols that go along with them? Uh, it, it would just, I mean, I, I could imagine that it was possible, but there's nothing in the oral teachings from our elders that, that say that that's the case. Mm -hmm. So at least, um, especially in the adult immersion program, as we're examining uh, learning the language through traditional stories, we don't really have any limitations on when we can or can't tell these stories. But we know, for example, in our relatives at Salish, like, they can't tell coyote stories in the summer. It's mm. only a winter thing. So in our case, we have some freedom because we just don't have that knowledge in yeah. our community anymore. So anyway, um, this next image was, uh, I created this for uh, a Chickasaw couple that's in their house now. And this is really more about um, the effect of loss. Like this is a Hopai, which is sort of um, one of the chief medicine people. And in this case, he's preparing for green corn um, and any of these um, epidemics or pandemics that our people experience, you know, we lost people of, of this sort. Um, and in particular, we lost their knowledge and the, its association on the landscape when we were removed to Oklahoma. So this is a representation of what is now absent. Mm -hmm. We have no initiated doctors who are still living in the Chickasaw Nation, the last having passed away in the late 80s or, or early 90s. Um, the, the the removal, <clears throat> the forced, you know, relocation that happened in 2014 when uh, we hosted uh, Timothy Keratu mm -hmm. and his students, Tepana Kiritango Tereo, the Chickasaw Nation uh, wonderfully hosted them on the last day mm -hmm. and they were singing uh, the song, mm -hmm. Ana. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm mispronouncing it, I apologize, but in your translation that you did, you translated mm -hmm. from, from Maori, the, then there was the English translation mm -hmm. that they gave you a link to, right. and then you translated it into Chickasaw, mm -hmm. but you spoke about that movement and mm -hmm. the names for the rivers, I think, mm -hmm. changed because it was um, the Widowmaker is that one of there that was one, passage or? Yeah, there, well, there was one that was Coffin Makers River. And in some instances, traditional community names came with us um, to Indian territory. And in other cases, you know, they remained in the homelands. But um, we, we are fortunate that we can, we remember them so we can, we can say them when, mm -hmm. we're, when we go back and stand on those places. We can remember what our ancestors um how they would call those particular places. Yeah. yeah. Have you, have you seen that happening now? are, you know, the way language shifts mm -hmm. and transitions is such a natural and almost unconscious process, mm -hmm. but working on language and there's always that, that issue of trying to keep it authentic, the original yeah. speech, yeah. which stops natural process. Right. It, it can hinder it sometimes, but with what you've been experiencing in your community, you know, these last challenging years, have mm -hmm. you seen these shifts? You've given names to COVID. Mm -hmm. Are things being spoken to a bit different? Yeah, I think really the, in our case, the, you know, our elders chose to actively reclaim the naming strategies of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And so they've done things like they can say cell phone or a zombie or, you know, whatever, something a kid wants to say. Yeah. They can sort of move the meaning of a terrible disease. Perhaps it was HIV or some kind of flu or some, just something terrible, but now it can encompass COVID. Mm. And this is something that they consciously chose to do, which is interesting. There are some ideologies in our community that say, you shouldn't be doing these things. You shouldn't be 
um, translating, you know, terms into the language, these modern terms, but that's exactly what they were doing. The word for horse is maybe 400 years old. That's a new word. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I think we're coming up. Yeah, and I think, you know, we're asking questions as we're going. Yeah, we'll I think get we're to, all right. Yeah, we'll get to right. your slides. This isn't a strict structure, yeah. but... Um, well, we're at, a, we're at a point now where we can, I'm just sort of showing um, the next slide there, okay. um, showing some of these additional works um, that I made on paper, um, kind of processing, using these familiar symbols, what was happening mm -hmm. in my life at the time. I will say, I don't know whether uh, other students of art history would recognize this, but I have a great affinity for Jasper Johns. I love his uh, consistent use and reuse of these really opaque symbols. We really don't know what they mean because he refuses to talk about his work. Mm. So I'm a lot chattier, I guess, than Jasper yeah. Johns, but I, I really, I really love, um, I really love Jasper Johns. I did a whole series in undergrad called I Love Jasper Johns. <laughs> it's pretty great. Anyway. Uh -huh. The the holes that were punched on the ledger, mm -hmm. those, mm -hmm. as you can see on the the right hand side, mm -hmm. those holes. What was there any reason? Did they say for the ledger? Yeah. So in this particular ledger, it would they were almost sort of like um, their reference points. They're cut out in a particular way, so you could read whatever was inscribed on the uncut part. Oh, okay. So it's a way for whomever was filling out the ledger. In this case, it was a general store to move ahead in time, you know, to do that day's accounting or yeah. whatever the case may be. But it is interesting that it echoes in part the circular figures that I'm using to yes. represent COVID. And then uh, I sort of strategically position the COVID figures in many cases where they leave the surface of the paper and they sort of echo these die cut pieces that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, there's another, you know, falling bones there's something beautiful about you know just allowing the surface to be something the paper and the writing on it and then putting these images on top of it and again the significance of them from 1918 1919 this next one later on um, in the pandemic this is sort of moving into 21 as i was preparing for um, indian market which was in person in 2021 in santa fe i started thinking about um, the nature of disease in our traditional teachings, diseases are caused by animals um, and they give those to us because we take and kill and eat them. Mm -hmm. um, and the plant world is what gives us protection. So animals make us sick and then the plants, because they're preyed upon, yeah. in some cases, right, by animals, they give us uh, the cures for these animal diseases. So I started thinking about um, sort of a positive turn, like what was going to happen? We have the vaccines. If only we had our medicine people, like they, could they have come up with something to deal mm -hmm. with this? Um, so in this case, I just have three examples. This is chihuahua, which is um, cedar. Mm -hmm. This is a really significant plant, not just to us, but I mean, find me a tribe that doesn't love cedar and use it. So yeah. I just represented these real simply on a much, this is a, a 1901 ledger um, that I got. Um, I love the handwriting and it was it was a little more because it's not so packed. It really gave me some space to explore other things. Um, this is one that we were talking about earlier, Shulup Tisili, which is a medicine that we use for washing after funerals. Mm -hmm. um, you have some in your car. Yeah. Because we were driving here, <laughs> I was like, hey, I know that. It, it has, has a different a use. Different use, right. It's, right. Um, is it all right if I share the name? Oh, yeah. So we call it horse mint up north in the south. You just said the name. Uh, ghost mint, horse mint, um, um, ghost also flag. Some, some people like to call it Indian perfume, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it's, you know, it's a really, really beautiful, um, gentle mm -hmm. um, type of medicine and plant that I've, I've grown up with, my elders use. Um, and especially during these times, you know, I really loved seeing how many of the people in our language revitalization community mm -hmm. really shifted to then integrate the language work they were doing and almost it's not even okay we're going to revitalize the language with this it wasn't like that it was mm -hmm. 
we're going to go out and we're going to harvest all of these and language just got carried along with it yeah, exactly. but harvesting the plants teaching about the plants and then um wonderful mentors i have ty and tippy tolman they were harvesting these and creating medicines specifically to what they were being you know shown mm -hmm. through ceremony mm -hmm. and their elders and making those available in care packages mm -hmm. for people who were sick that's beautiful um and sending those out and you know some of their medicines they have like a a bear rub, chest rub mm -hmm. all of these and then adding the language and the names to them yeah. um and teaching us about them mm -hmm. is such wonderful work and those are all these backstories to these images mm -hmm. when you think about it like the power of the thing itself what it means in the language you know extending relationships over time and space like everything comes with the language yeah. because the language is everything and, and it, everything is the language, right? It is. And you know, that that's the power of, you know, ancestral knowledge mm -hmm. and enacting that today mm -hmm. is we are able to do a time jump right? Exactly. where we bring and stretch across space and time mm -hmm. and our ancestors are right there with us. Yeah. And that's what language does with us. That's mm -hmm. what, you know, this art and practice mm -hmm. does being a practitioner. That's kind of that power and medicine and mm -hmm. ability that, that we're able to do that is largely kind of misunderstood or mm -hmm. misinterpreted is yeah. what do we mean when we say these ancestral items and collections are alive? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, yeah. if you follow the teachings, the way we believe about them, they have that spirit with mm -hmm. them. Even though we're separated by hundreds of years and the collections here, thousands of years, mm -hmm we are separated but actually we're not we're right next to each other yeah in that space yeah. um i mean what's a thousand years yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> in history all right moving on this next one is chumak chumak this is a traditional indian tobacco mm. um we really have uh, pretty strong tobacco cessation programs on the reservation but i mean people still use traditional tobacco in a way that it ought to be used so i couldn't help but represent that one as well mm. Another work I created for Indian Market um, was this. This is a uh, four million three hundred thirty-three thousand and ninety-four. If I remember right, this was the total maybe case counts at the time, like how many people had actually been sickened by the disease. But I, I, I can't recall. I don't think there was that many casualties at that time. Mm -hmm. um, the next one was, an, was a work on paper that preceded a physical object and. Um, we can go ahead and actually move to the image of the object itself. So this is a COVID mask. And uh, someone pointed out that I should have made it a bat um, because of, you know, the wet market in, yeah. in China. But, you know, when I think about um, some of our most significant diseases ancestrally really had to do with, um, with deer. So mm -hmm. I thought about this idea of the animal <clears throat> world attacking us, the anthropomorphic person, um, but with deer antlers. And you can see the, the COVID symbol there in both the eyes and the mouth of the figure. And of course it being primarily, I mean, a respiratory disease that affects you know, our, our um, circulatory system and so forth. Yeah. I, I wanted this sort of idea of an open mouth breathing out. And you can see there's copper ear spools which were um, really prominent um, amongst Chickasaw men and women um, years ago. Mm -hmm. um, not shockingly, this one did not sell because who wants to live with this mask? Yeah, but um, it is, you know, the, and there <laughs> is that question, you know, especially yeah. with materials that are, are taken mm -hmm. out of mountains mm -hmm. is materials were made and then buried with a purpose. Exactly. Um, and we have a responsibility to respect mm -hmm. those past intentions. Yeah. We also have responsibility to empower mm -hmm. past intentions and, um, you know, that's part of the work that I'm bridging mm -hmm. into is how do we really empower our ancestors, those makers who infused mm -hmm. so much into their works. Right. And I think you really can't get to a level of understanding that unless you help be a maker yourself. No, it's true. And this is something that in this case with this mask, you know, I encountered this Spyro Deer Man mask which was, I mean, it was violated. It was removed from the body that it was buried with. Mm -hmm. it, it is, you know, it was, it's been on exhibit. I first encountered it. I opened a drawer. I was on a cherry picker 
at Suitland, Maryland, and there it was. And I just, I mean, it lit me up. Like every mm -hmm. hair on my body stood up. So it's powerful. So when you have an object like that, it's been removed from its original context. What do you do with it? We know it's an ancestor. The body of that person has been incorporated into the object. There's still a spirit there in this object. So how can, can we honor this even though it's not where it ought to be? It really ought to be in the ground, mm. um, uh, but it, it's not. So in this mm -hmm. case, I was thinking of that image in particular, the power of that mask, and also contemporary um, Cherokee booger masks which is, I understand the tradition was largely developed as a, in a sort of a response, a ceremonial response to European disease. So all of these things came together in this particular yeah. mask. Um, so here's some, some more later works on paper. Um, this next one is a large um, mixed media on canvas. This is another memento mori. It's, it's the same text, Chilachika um, Nofunka, remember that you will die. We have the sort of floating hearts in the background, the COVID eye again, the heart, and then this large central skull. Um, finally, this last work on paper. Um, I completed this in maybe early August of 21, right before I went to Santa Fe for the market. Um, and then finally, I have one more object for us to discuss this afternoon. Um, this was made for an exhibit um, of the five, the five nations, you know, so Chickasaw, Choctaw Creek, Cherokee, Seminole. Um, and everyone in, the, in this particular exhibit, which opens Friday at Tulsa, by the way. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, we all have mixed ancestry um, from Celtic peoples, um, you know, English, well, English aren't Celtic, anyway, English, the, Irish, the, Scottish. The exhibit, maybe, and we'll try to add the link later on because yeah. I've seen a lot yeah. of, um, you know, social media. Yeah. The exhibit is kind of the first of its kind in Tulsa. Well, I mean, I've, I've never been, it's, it's so interesting, like these works that all of us created to sort of link our Celtic ancestry with our indigenous ancestry, given the long standing relationships from Celtic peoples in the Americas, you mm -hmm. know, when they immigrated here um, and became, you know, intermarried in our communities. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. So in this case, um, it's a Eurasian widgeon, which is a type of duck that occurs in Asia and in Europe. You find them sometimes rarely in the Americas, but they're not really indigenous here. So I thought, well, you know, I love to make these duck effigies. I want to do something that would occur in Ireland. And so what I did was really a, a mashup of these ancestral um, moundful uh, designs, anthropomorphic and um, duck images. There's other, many, many other animal images from Moundville that are in pottery and so forth. Um, so I was drawing from Moundville ancestors and then also from the Book of Kells, which is a significant, you know, mm. medieval um, illuminated manuscript from Ireland. Um, see another, you know, sort of variation there, but you can see the forked eye design, which is from a peregrine falcon. It's associated with warriors. Mm. This sort of teardrop, and in the middle of the teardrop shape is the COVID uh, symbol itself. And then on this uh, next slide, um, let's actually move ahead. We'll be able to see the, the speculum pattern. Okay. You can see that it's actually um, a Moundville, a representation from Moundville of a, of a traditional Irish cladach from Galway. Um, mm. The hands generally meeting a heart mm -hmm. and then a crown. Yes. Um, and so in this case, it's, it's again, this sort of riff on this object was created in a particular time and place, thinking about my ancestry from all of these people. Um, the beauty of this life I get to share with my wife. We both have Clada on our wedding rings. Mm -hmm. um, and then knowing that we have uh, an expiration date. It's just something that pushes us closer um, together. So this is a really significant piece for me. I was really happy to have made it. And uh, if I was going to miss the opening, at least I'm here at Yale. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it'll be touring after it leaves Living Arts at Tulsa. It'll tour to the Choctaw Cultural Center. And so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be able to see the entire exhibit at that point. Uh -huh. um, and and uh, I did fail to mention the, the color symbolism is drawn from the modern Irish flag there in the, uh, in this. In the wing patch. Okay. Yes. yes. So the, uh, we can go back to forward rather. Go forward? Yeah. 
so here's um, here's all my socials, Instagram, Twitter. You can find me on Facebook, my website. Um, this is uh, this is sort of the extent of my presentation for today. But but I will say it's really important for me to acknowledge um, my many many teachers over these last two decades. You know, um, I, I was born and raised in West Texas. Uh, I descend from three generations of boarding school survivors. We did not have any of this knowledge. Mm -hmm. We didn't have language. I'm not some light-skinned traditional dude. I'm just a light-skinned guy who was taught to be a good Chickasaw <laughs> yeah. um, by my teachers. And so really all of my understanding is something that I've come, uh, it's come out of my work with them over these last 20 years. And it really is, um, I remember a point in time where I really felt free to examine these, these works, uh, this sort of the side of my Chickasaw heritage and my vis visual production. And now as a speaker of the language, I feel sort of even more empowered to continue to do this work. And it's not either or, it's both. Yeah. Know, right? And I think, you know, we, we've had this discussion before and, um, you know, uh, Kosh and I, we, we started out our, our doctoral program mm -hmm. kind of in the same year. He finished a bit before me. Mm -hmm. I just finished. Um, but one of the, the first things in our class with Raquel, mm -hmm. who is tough but excellent mm -hmm. um, professor of ours, is Ra Raquel Yamada. And mm -hmm. we asked, I think you asked like, why? Why do you want to learn your language? Why, like what's important? Mm -hmm. And um, I think without dropping a beat, I said, you know, I wanna know the secrets. Mm, all of them. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, cause so much is embedded in that mm -hmm. language work and mm -hmm. it very much is the same way with artwork mm -hmm. is these really beautiful works that, you know, if we're lucky, if we're privileged mm -hmm. and we're in the right place, we'll learn a little bit more about them. Exactly. And so from the work that you've done with language work and artwork, I know you started out doing art. Mm -hmm. What yeah. was the importance or experience you had with being an artist and then being called upon to be one of the few language revitalization mm. groups? Yeah, this is, I'm, I'm glad you asked this. This is really interesting. I've often described myself as a college onset Indian. <laughs> so as I mentioned, I was raised in West Texas we had so, I mean, we had like no cultural knowledge in my family uh, because three generations of boarding school will do that mm -hmm. to a family. And so in, in, uh, in my case, I have really, I always like my primary identity was as a white person who I was part Chickasaw, you know, as a young person. I was really intensely proud of that. But there was something about moving to Albuquerque and encountering so many other native people. Um, Dr. Amanda Cobb published a book um, about a Bloomfield Chickasaw boarding school and I'm seeing like names of like my aunties um, you know and cousins and like you know we're we're in this book and I started reflecting on everything that my grandmother had taught me so it was something about that moment and the birth of our first son Levi who I call Chokfi which means rabbit mm -hmm. it all coalesced into like I, I just there was something there I felt like I was missing something I wanted to become a better Chickasaw person. There was this really strong shift in my identity. And perhaps this is something that's, I mean, it's a privilege of a non-phenotypical native person to choose moment to moment how we're gonna identify. Mm -hmm. But for me today, I'm a proud Chickasha man who happens to be part white and who looks like this. <laughs> Whatever, it's cool. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, kinda I'm, weird. I'm way over <laughs> it, I'm way over it. So because of that, you know, I, uh, at, at, as we had Levi, um, he was born in 2000. You know, I intended on being a studio artist, a professional artist, perhaps getting an MFA and teaching somewhere. But having a child really freaked me out. And I thought, well, how can I be marketable? I'm going to do art history. So I did art history. Uh, the nation called and said, hey, come back. We have a job for you. So I started doing museum, curatorial archive work, museum work. And I started hanging out with these old folks. And I figured out within a couple of years that like language was something that really came naturally to me. Mm. Um, so all of these, all of these funny things led to a life of work in language that even as a little boy, when I was nerding out with my Chickasaw dictionary, you know, giving myself like fake Indian names and stuff like that. <laughs> I never thought that, that I would be able to do at my professional life would be spent with 90 year olds mm -hmm. um, speaking Chickasaw. Yeah. 
and it draws you in. You know, it drew, it drew me into ceremonial life. Like I learned how to sing, how to lead, how to announce at the ceremonial ground, sing Choctaw hymns, and just be a part of the community in the best way that I know how. So that's really what I want to do today: is just honor, honor my my teachers, my ancestors, and I'm just trying my level best to be the best Chickasaw man that I can be. Yeah. On the daily, and I know they'll forgive me when I screw up. <laughs> yeah. And it it really is, you know, the those type of skills. What we talk about the life of language is language really is going to um, excel mm -hmm. when we infuse it with other skills. Mm -hmm. And being an artist um, or a maker, a practitioner, mm -hmm. and whether you're a scientist, uh, a doctor, mm -hmm. all of those carrying that language through that work mm -hmm. is how it's going to live on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and thank you, you know, so much for sharing this information with us. Um, we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions okay. now. we got about 15 minutes. Well, we um, really talked a while. I uh, know, it went by fast. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask Morgan over here if there's anything from the chat that you think we could ask. And then let's look at the, I think I can pull up the question and answer. Here we go. But I'll let you go first, Morgan. I think ending on the note of infusing language with tangible um, things in life, uh, we have a question that's mm -hmm. asking about um, how important is the language in, in the artwork that you make? Um, mm -hmm. And what is your language practice outside of your uh, artwork? So the language is, I mean, you can see throughout this presentation, everything that I create is titled in the language. And in mm -hmm. some cases, it's actually our traditional stories or shikonopa or historical moments in time that inspire the work itself. Um, so as a speaker of the language, I incorporate it in this sort of push and pull fashion, depending on um, you know, the project at hand. But in terms of my language practice um, you know, at home, I, uh, I do all sorts of crazy stuff. Like I talk to myself, <laughs> I text we, with my elders. Lots of talking to trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talking to animals. Trees. We meet with native speakers about three times a week. Um, and I'm a respondent, especially on Fridays, I'm a respondent in the same way that they are. So I'll be answering questions in the language. And even though, you know, I'm, I mean, I maybe I'm a fluent speaker of the language. That still doesn't mean that I don't make mistakes, but they're mm -hmm. they're very generous toward me. And it's also something I think good for our younger learners to see that a second language speaker can become fluent and mm -hmm. can hang with our grannies and grandpas. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. I just hope that they can model my wacky path because it worked for me anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, is there anything else from the chat, or should we move to the? There's um, another question. I know you you mentioned um, the kind of Celtic colors on mm -hmm. the last um, duck decoy that mm -hmm. you showed, and we have another question asking about um, how how you choose color in the rest of your work, if that is um, oh. intentional in any way. Okay. There was a, a bright blue that this um, this one audience member was yeah. very drawn to. So um, a oh, the wolf. yeah, a, a lot of the a lot of the work that I do, in particular. Um, the bird effigies. I choose colors that are just sort of um, heightened representations of the natural plumage. Mm. I mean, I might bump it up a little bit just to make it exciting and contrasty. Um, and then, especially in the speculum, for example, like that pintail that we saw, all of those um, colors in the pintail speculum, the COVID pintail, naturally occur in the speculum of a pintail duck. And in other cases, um, I use in particular a traditional color palette of black, red, and white. And those are, they've been significant um, colors for our people for the longest. And it's not just us, but really almost every nation of the Southeast, red, white, and black is going to be something that's significant to them. So sometimes I'll do white on black duck, sometimes I'll do red, um, black on red, those sort of things. Um, but yeah, it's sort of a mixture. Sometimes it's, it's, I push it more towards a ceremonial side. Like, what does this color represent? Is it medicine? Is it war? Is it death? Is it life? And it depends on the, the you know, sometimes on the medium. Is it a work on paper? Am I doing a sculpture? But if it's a bird sculpture, generally, I, I try to incorporate how the creator made it to look. And I just sort of bump it up a little bit. Mm. Yeah. All right. So one of the last questions in here is... Um, 
I am interested in knowing more about your training as an artist. Mm. Did you have the opportunity to study with any Native teachers? No, that, interestingly enough, um, my first formal training, I was a young preteen, maybe early teen, and I studied with a landscape painter, a Western painter from Taos, New Mexico. And so my early work um, was re a whole lot of like Taos school, Western impressionism, that kind of stuff. And then I had a series of teachers in undergraduate that were really influential, um, non-objective painter, a really incredible sculptor. But during that entire time, I never explored my ancestry in that work because I just didn't feel like it was my place. Mm -hmm. And this had to do with my sort of thinking of myself as a white person who happened to have Chickasaw ancestry, but it wasn't mine to claim. Um, but it was really after moving to Albuquerque in like 2001, 2002, then, uh, then I just, I don't know, I felt emboldened in some way that I could start exploring these things and that it was okay to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, a lot of um, the work that's happening now and that I've been part of in the past is one, really getting those perspectives from the artists mm -hmm. is that along with their works, looking at them and appreciating them, but also appreciating the artists, their journey, mm -hmm. their background, their experience, mm -hmm. and how do we represent that in the best way? Mm -hmm. Well, and it's sort of as contemporary people, like we're here and now, our languages are here and now, our ceremonies are here and now. You know, so I can be here as a speaker of Chickasaw who's creating visual work, but I'm quoting just as heavily from Jasper Johns as I might be from my Moundville ancestors. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. I'm, I'm the opposite of a purist. Mm -hmm. uh, if language is life and language is living, let's make it live. And that means visually too. Yeah. Yeah. With... um. So with your work, your specific Chickasaw work, mm -hmm. do you have a process or do you make it part of your teaching practice to actually educate your students or the ones that you work with about how to interpret works? What symbols mm. represent and yeah. the motifs represent? Yeah, I, I mean, we do have sort of overt conversations like amongst you know, my peers that are also visual artists or perhaps somebody on social media is like, hey, what's going on with this symbol? What does this even mean? And in particular, the duck effigies that I create, there's a whole world of, of generally speaking, non-Indian decoy collectors, mm -hmm. and they have no idea what to make of my stuff. Like I'll go to some decoy show and I'm showing this Indian thing and they're like, what in the world, what's going on here? So it's an opportunity for me to educate, not just you know, friends and family, people that are interested in my work, collectors, but also people who just don't have any reference. In many cases, I'm like the only American Indian person they've ever met. Yeah. Which is really sad. There's far more Indian people than I, but and I'm that, the one that showed up. <laughs> <laughs> That's the different kind of, uh, let's say, worlds that you traverse mm -hmm. is you're not just creating the decoys. You're mm -hmm. also an avid hunter and your practical oh, use yes. of them, you are creating ones that then you go yeah. and you use that's true and you too. test out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a whole part of your life. Yeah, this, this whole sort of like subsistence hunting. I mean, I grew up hunting when I started um, duck hunting. You know, we eat everything that, mm -hmm. that we kill. <clears throat> um, I felt just this desire to begin to make my own working decoy. So my entire spread is all wooden birds made by me or, or others, friends of mine. Um, and then I just use, I use the techniques of construction that I was taught by friends of mine from Eastern Carolina, North Carolina principally, like Jerry Talton or um, Chase Luker. And so I'm making these Chikasha effigies um, using the techniques of say, you know, like the late 19th, early 20th century North Carolina decoy maker, but I'm painting them in such a way that, and the forms too, mm -hmm. really. They really reference, in particular, Moundville ancestors and then early Chikasha ancestors. So, I mean, you could put a line tie on any of my effigy birds, and you could shoot a duck over. It. They would be able they to would, work. They would come. Yeah. Would come. <laughs> Is yeah. there a traditional practice of decoys that you found with Chickasaw? So, no. In native in Native North America, there are there's significant decoying traditions, like with Shinnecock. Mm -hmm. Charles Sumner Bunn was a native maker of decoys. 
um, who passed in the mid, like maybe 1950s, he was born around 1860 something. And then of course, if you go further west, there's the famous um, Lovelock cave birds, which are natural skins that cover um, uh, Thule reed forms. Mm -hmm. So we know that there are, well, and even up north, you know, Ojibwe people, Ojibwe yes. Cree, there's lots of decoying traditions. But in our case, um, we know that we ate waterfowl because their bones occur in trash pits. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, limited descriptions in particular of hunting swans, which are most traditional, traditionally speaking, our most significant ceremonial bird. But that was a process of, um, you know, using torches at night on their roosts, and then you would, you would kill them that way as opposed to like a decoy. Mm -hmm. So our ancestors did actively hunt waterfowl and consume them as a part of their just surviving right in the old country. Yeah. But um, as far as we know, this whole Chikasha decoy thing is like a brand new deal, just straight out of my brain. There. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I really, I really appreciate your integration of all of these areas. You're mm -hmm. drawing upon, you know, Western knowledge with mm -hmm. your own upbringing, your knowledge, which you're forward about, you know, this, you started with your Chickasaw education mm -hmm. intentional really avid when yeah. you're a bit older right um but being able to bridge all of those areas mm -hmm. and bring together this dynamic um these works mm -hmm. that span all of your ancestral relations right. um that's wonderful to see and i look forward to you know the amount of work we're going to see in the future and how we can continue to make this relationship um of the work that you do and your knowledge and input to help mm -hmm. us expand our knowledge with our collections as well. Um, also with our birds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Ornithology yeah. Lab, uh, you know, checking out these different types of collections is so important for the work that we do to mm -hmm. see it in person. Yeah is really important well, and to be able to in, in, in our case like today you know to be able to firsthand be with these you know bird relatives that have because of colonial of colonization have, <clears throat> have gone extinct yeah but the carolina like, parakeet right passenger pigeon um they say ivory billed woodpeckers are still around in louisiana so i hope that's the case yeah but um, I mean, just to be able to be with them in person and know their names and call them by their names, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And that's not something, you know, that we, like we were talking about that I could have done in my teens um, because it just wasn't something that I was raised up with. And I think that's something that's so important in Indian country is let's not front, let's be who we are. There are many, many ways of being native. Let's help one another. Mm -hmm. You know, so if some kid who's completely disconnected can follow this road that I've been on, and it makes his or her path easier than I've done. I've done yeah. an okay job. Yeah. 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 So this series of Oaking Ancestral Memory is built out of a, a course that I developed here at Yale through my fellowships. Um, Morgan's in it. Uh, many wonderful students are here that have taken it. And it's about how do we learn about reinterpreting um, collections, ancestral collections and contemporary works that are in um, institutions like Yale um, and private collections, federal collections, public collections, all of those. What is the work that we can do together to really empower our ancestors and the makers that help created these pieces? And what questions do we have about those works? Um, specifically, those questions, how can we better answer those when we work with living artists today? So establishing a pattern of conversations mm -hmm. and relationship making yeah. with living artists when we want to commission work or acquire works mm -hmm. or encourage works and support those, um, that's what it goes back to. And mm -hmm. that's, I think, what language revitalization has done for me. And being a maker and practitioner myself mm -hmm. is you know, making sure we take care of those relationships mm -hmm. that we have, both living, mm -hmm. um, tangible, mm -hmm. and also what's going on in our minds and spirits and hearts. So 
I want to thank you all for joining us today. That is our time. A uh, recording of this will be made available on the Yale University Art Gallery YouTube page um, in a week or so, hopefully. If you have any questions, please reach out to Lakosh. Um, you can reach out to me, royce.youngwolf at yale.edu. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Mazigrat, zagatio, etzigets. Yakuki, chamanali.